Wired 868 with Lasana Library. <laughs> If, if you were to ask me, you know, who are the people that inspire me is all the people who are very passionate, like the Kevin Garnett's and all these kind of people who don't hide their passion. Because where is the fight in you? You know? You have to understand that there's only one chance we have to live here. You know? After this, there's no more. You know? So what you do between your first and your last breath is important. So. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm an emotionally charged individual, so this season that ended, you know, the carnival, I went at it like it was, you know, do or die every night. I was always the type of individual that losing was not an issue. How we lose is the biggest issue. If you lose without effort, right, if we lose because we didn't care, or you didn't look over this detail, right? It just laps because you feel to lapse. But if you give the best account of yourself, that is all. You know, and that is one of the things that, you know, you to like bother me. That, okay, if you don't give this particular effort and you know you didn't put all that effort, you know, you need to go back to the drawing board. You need to fight a little bit harder. The first time I heard the show, from Doggy Fresh, Slip Rick. That's back in the 80s, early 80s, right? And that's a, that was a rap song. I stretched that cassette for the people who don't know what a cassette is. You know, um, <clears throat> and my mom and dad, they just allowed me to just free up when it came to music. You know, I think my dad used to play records, he used to play some filler cootie records, and at that time, I didn't know who Fela Kuti was. I just was drawn to, you know, the, 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 the African beats and then, you know, we would watch American Top 10 with Casey Kasem and then right after that would be Party Time and then after that would be Video Soul and then after that we listen to radio for the entire afternoon. You know, we would listen to people like Rennie B and all these different, you know, personalities and DJs and then the night it had a, a, a reggae segment as well. I could remember all these things. So. My entire day consisted of music of all genres, you know, and um, I appreciated that. Another change that took place in my life, I went to Pity Valley Boys RC School because I lived in Pity Valley. And at the age of 11 or 12, my mom said, okay, let's move to Karanaj. And when I moved to Karanaj, I was a totally different, different, different way of living. Um, I met people who facilitated me in terms of making me bring this talent that I had up to a certain level. So the very first block hole that I went to and I saw people chanting and instrumentals running and stuff like that, I was about 13, 14. I said, I want to do that. Well, Magadan was a uh, 15 year old in Karanan, you know, but in now starting you know, um, writing songs and I had a dream, you know, that, hey, I'm going to become an entertainer after school. So at the age of 17, my friend Kerry Maynard, he organized an audition at the Caribbean Sound Basin for me. And uh, I went and I, sh and I saw the late great Sheldon Shellshock Benjamin. And he auditioned me and he said, hey, we're going to call you back. And I looked at him and I said, you tell everybody that. He said, yes, we do. But I'm telling you, I am going to personally call you. And I missed the call, but my mom got the call. And she said, hey, these people from Caribbean Song Basin call and I just like light up like a Christmas tree. That was the beginning of Magadan. Yeah. What was it like for, for, for Magadan trying to, to, to get his foot in at that point in time? Well, it was good to see that, you know, we had, you know, different artists coming out from, you know, Trinidad and Tobago that had that same fire and that same passion, you know, and the talent level, you know. Bungie Garden is an exceptional talent, you know, um, KMC, fantastic performer. And um, 
three sons came out, you know, a couple of years after. And we had a great batch of talented people, you know. So we got a stage because it was more than one. Sometimes when you're the only one, it's difficult for you to chart your course. But when people realize, hey, it had more than one, you know, we pull each other in this kind of, you know, involuntary way now. Right? Because of Galen's exceptional talent, everybody had to step up. You know? And then when we step up, he had to step up. You know, and then the likes of Rupi coming across some Barbados, you know, with his different talent and then Talpri. So it was beautiful to have that, you know, range of talent in the music around the carnival time. And the people, the audiences appreciated that because it brought something different. Yeah. Maximus Dan came in 2000, yeah, in the year 2000 when I went to Toronto. Uh, myself and my manager at the time, Simon Batiste, we went to watch a movie. The name of the movie was The Gladiator. The story was very compelling, some things I could relate to, you know. And um, I walked out of the theater saying, no longer Magadan, Maximus died. He was drawn in. And he had to fight, but he had to entertain. Because Proximo told him, you could kill everybody in one swoop, but the audience does not like that. So when you slash, you need to point to the crowd. Right? And after every man who has faced you has gone down, then perhaps he would win your freedom. You know? So it wasn't just about how good he was, but how much he could entertain. And I said, hey, I have a decent voice, I have decent songs, but I need to become a better entertainer. You know, I need people to enjoy what I do, just as much as I think I enjoy what I do. So when I went to London many years ago, I ended up in a house you know, where a guy by the name of Smokey, who played on BBC Radio, he, he lived there. And I start talking about life and I talking about I'm about 22 years old. And he look at me and he say, young boy, you do song like 22, you know. Yeah, yeah you sound like you're my age. He said, but since you sound that particular way, I'm going to give you some music. To listen to and Soka Train was on that CD and that is why I read the song. At that point in time a lot of things were going on in the industry and no one is still going on and probably was going on at the time you know that Gypsy wrote the song but he wanted to reflect a positive side. I said okay he said everybody getting down on the Soka Train I say no more loving up on the Soka Train. So it wasn't like a counteraction, but like an update, you know, and the other side of it. Because on the train, not everybody, on, on, not every passenger, you know, had the same positive mentality. It came on New Year's Day, 9 o'clock in the morning, and by 3 p.m., it was a hit. Everywhere. Well, yeah, because the much mature audience that may have been, you know, guessing, you know, the fans say, who is this fella, you know? You know, I won over them, you know, with that song, and then they were drawn to the other things that I was doing. But because sometimes all they need is one, eh? Put fun on.